The story of the, the chet et sadat, the sin of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, is a very bizarre story. It, it involves a snake, it, seduction, tricking. If we would put ourselves in their shoes, in the Garden of Eden. Now, we're told, God says to Adam, I made, I made all these trees. You have all the fruit from all these trees. It's a, an unlimited source of of, of, of tasty nourishment, right? Or you can eat buffet. However, there's one tree here that I've put in the middle that I want you to stay away from. That one is off limits. You can have anything you want, as much as you want, anything you want from all of the trees of the garden, all of the trees in the garden, but this one in the middle you can't touch. Now, does that sound like a very hard test to you guys? You know, especially if you consider how, how you have other options, right? So my, my, my question is, how, well, what's so hard about it, first of all? Second of all, how does a test like this relate to us? The Bible is a story of, 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 you, of mankind and, and its development and its connection with Hashem. What is the takeaway from this story? What does the story really teach me? And, and how do I pl- apply the story to my life and my challenges? I think at least on a basic level, we can all relate that once something is off limits to you, that creates this idea of maybe a, more of a temptation, more of a desire for it, right? Mm-hmm. There's actually a verse in the, in the scripture that says that stolen waters are, are, are sweeter. You know, having something that really you, you're not really supposed to have it cre- creates or adds a pleasure and an excitement to it. And so, at least on a basic level, the fact that God said you just can't have it made it a challenge, made it more desirable, and, and, and that's where this is all focusing around. But the question then becomes... What is the lesson from that to, to us? How do we learn from that? How do we apply that and maybe fix that mistake? Because we are all here a continuation of Adam and Eve. We are continuing the story because the story is really the challenges and the tests that bring us to a much higher, more complete level. So how do we kind of not make that mistake in our life, bringing a rectification to it? Okay, so that we'll get to that. So I think connected... Is, is this approach. This is an approach that I, that I think I found very comfortable for me. Adam and Eve were really one unit, right? Husband and wife, we, t- we know that they're two parts of a, of, of a whole, soulmates. So they really represent the idea of just one, one person, one unit in a world without anyone else to relate to. Okay? We live in a world full of many other people. We relate to, to many other people. So it's hard to create the exact same scenario because they were alone and we're not alone. But if we could understand perhaps the connection between their challenge in a world where they were alone and apply to a world where we share with others, I think we can, we can accomplish a lot. And here's what I'm trying to get at. Today we know that the quality of living is, is, is incredible compared to what it once was. Right? We could say that we all live like kings. We live better than kings lived once upon a time. So the big question is this. If we live better than kings used to live, so why are we not satisfied? Why aren't we so happy? So I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. It's that king next door or the king across the street. His kingdom is a little bit bigger than mine. He's got two, two three cars, a big house. Because... It's a relation. It's all in relation to what we have is, 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 is seen through a lens of what the other person has. Since everybody's living this quality of life, we can all have a cappuccino, nice you know, homemade cappuccino in the morning, so we're not satisfied because everyone has it. And when we look around and we see other people have more, so then we become dissatisfied with what we in fact do have. Which is in fact a silly idea because how can I let that person that's outside of me and has nothing to do with my life, how can I let him steal my happiness? steal my satisfaction. That's, that's, ultimately, it's foolish of me to let him do that to me. But it's really me doing it to myself. And so we're talking about a maturity, an understanding of how to be complete within, which creates a, a happiness that's, and a satisfaction in life that's not affectable. That, that, then the people around me don't affect that. Confidence in myself and what I have, what I'm accomplishing, and belief in God and what he gave me should be enough. And that's what we're looking at right here. Let's now take what we've said and apply it to Adam and Eve. Okay? When you're alone in a world, 
and there is no one else to look at. So seemingly this doesn't exist. The idea of letting someone else take away your happiness doesn't exist. The idea of seeing what they have and wanting it and letting it detract from your satisfaction and what you have. So they didn't have this test. So seemingly they live in a world that we don't, that, that we don't live in. Or we live in a world that they didn't live in. And there's no correlation between our challenges. But what I think the commonality is this. And this is the, the beauty and the depth of this commandment and what makes it so applicable to our life. Hashem understood for Adam and Eve that don't have anyone else in their world, by taking one of the things that I have created and taking it away from them, made it forbidden, that is in a way similar to what when we look at what other people have that we can't have. So that's the commonality, that's, that's the idea of the connection. So for Adam and Eve, the test of not having from this particular tree, even though they had so many other trees that they could have been satisfied from, is similar to me not being satisfied with what I have and wanting exactly what I can't have because it belongs to someone else. This idea is actually pro uh, one of the prime fundamental ideas in, in, in Judaism and in life. It's one of the Ten Commandments. You know, the Ten Commandments ends off with an idea that we should not Look to our fellow and desire what he has. We should not desire what, you know, his possessions. And that's, that is, we could almost say, the root of many evils. The competition, the jealousy, that is, it, it, looking around us is probably one of our biggest downfalls. Probably the big starts of many wars, family conflicts. It's, it, it's, it's linked to so much problems in this world. And now, if we're correct in our analysis, in our idea, we've connected it to the first, the, the, big, the first downfall of mankind, the first challenge that, that we didn't live up to in the Garden of Eden. So, so what's the solution? The solution is, I guess, easier said than done. But what this points at is a concept, a very common concept taught in, by the sages is this. Ultimately, the key to happiness, right? How can we all live the life of a millionaire? How can we all live the life of a millionaire? Well, let's get uh, Donald Trump to give out a million bucks to everybody, right? The government just finished giving, giving out tons of money, so but obviously they don't have enough money to make us all millionaires. So how can we all live the life of a millionaire? So let's, let's I think, go really uh, to the heart of what financial wealth gives a person. Financial wealth gives a person stability and the ability to do, I think, in general, we could just say two things. He can have what he needs, and more than that, because he has a lot of money, he can have what he wants. He can also be comfortable in the fact that things will, will go fine for him. He won't have to worry, how's he going to survive, how's he going to pay the rent. He has what he needs, and more than that, he has what he wants, right? So those are the qualities of a rich man, of a millionaire. How can we all have those same qualities without getting the million? Because it's not everyone can have that million. So how do we have those same qualities without getting the million? You can just be satisfied with what you have and you know, thank God every day that you have life, you know, a state of blessing. Exactly. And here's what the, the, the heart of this idea. By being satisfied with what you have, you instantly attain those qualities that are usually reserved for rich people. So we can all be rich if we can train ourselves to want less. You know, what, what gets in the way of so, someone's happiness? If I want so much things that are beyond my grasp that I cannot have, then I'm miserable. But if I instantly do not want those things, then I'm not missing them anymore. So the idea is to be satisfied as much as you can with what you have. This is, in fact, a teaching from the sages in the Ethics of the Fathers. It says, who is a rich man? And instead of answering, the, the guy's got a million bucks, which is the basic answer, it answers there, the one who's happy with his portion. Being happy with your portion instantly affords you the opportunity to be satisfied. And if you're satisfied, then nothing's missing. Now, the work involved in this is obviously we have to be mature enough and we have to have an inner we have to go inside for that satisfaction and happiness that we often look outside. A metal car that's just really meant to take you from place to place should not be the source of your, of your fulfillment in life. The, a car is there to bring you from point A to point B. If you're accomplishing nothing on your way from point A to point B, like many people in Mercedes and BMWs, what are they accomplishing? They're just taking a piece of metal, jumping in it, and going, from, going like a pinball machine around, going nowhere. 
and that they think is going to give them happiness. Maturity. We have to. We have to grow up. You know, too many people in this world are growing older but not growing up. If we would grow up and realize that the real self worth and satisfaction out of life is coming from within us, we don't have to look outside to fill ourselves up. We're we're already full within. So with that outlook, with Hashem and with Hashem's help, we can learn the lesson of Adam and Eve. You have enough. You have enough around you. Everything you need, you already have, because God gave it all to you. With that in mind, then we can see people around us with different things, maybe even more things, and realize that's what maybe they need for their purpose and for their happiness. But I have what I need for my purpose and my happiness.